Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Hello, Patrick Dunno here, news editor at the Irish Farmers Journal. This week, I sat down with Agriculture Minister Simon Coveney for his final interview before the general election. You can read his answers to our questions on all farming issues in this week's Farmers Journal and at farmersjournal.ie. Let's listen to what he said when I asked him about the challenges he faced during his five years as Agriculture Minister. We've obviously had some big challenges. I mean, horse meat was the first big one. Uh, I think we got through that, actually, and managed to enhance the reputation of the Irish food industry um, when things could have gone the other way very easily. Um, so we worked late into the night on that to make sure that we protected consumers. And on the one hand, we were tough on people who had made mistakes and should have known better. Uh, and I got some criticism for being tough on them from the industry. Uh, but I think the the proof of of our robustness in terms of the response to horse meat and our systems, um, I think, is in the aftermath of it. When actually most people would say, "How come Ireland was the first in Europe to uncover the horse meat crisis?" Because it because it affected twenty six of the twenty eight member states. Uh, likewise, you know, we had a BSE incident. Um, but again, our systems allowed us to isolate that and show that it was a one off. When somebody comes into your room and said, Minister. I think we have a problem here. Like, what what then happens with regard to a horse meat or a BSC? Well, I mean, I, I mean, my style is to is to is to try and take personal control of it. To put a team together in place in the, in the department to make sure that we're responding and giving it the emergency attention that it deserves, and that I manage the message then uh, and try and lead from the front. And that's what I've tried to do in horse meat. That's what I did in BSC. That's what I've done, you know, on the fodder crisis when it was there. You know, my style is not to say, look, let the department deal with this in their own way uh, and to try and hide under a bush somewhere. Uh, If there's problems, we'll solve them. Uh, And I think that's been my style and I hope that has strengthened the food industry. And just with regard to payments, we put out through our Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and all that questions for Minister Coveney and I'd say 90% of them were payments and delays thereof. What, what is causing the, the, the delays? What are well, the I mean, can I just put this, in, this into context sure. first? Because I think it's, it, it's important that people would understand that, right? Ireland was one of only seven member states in the European Union to deliver advance payments before December. Uh, and the only one to deliver 70% advance payment by mid-October. Right. So, and to so, say that though commitments are given, and it's, it has always been the way that if you if you get your single farm or your basic no. payment application in in May, you will get paid in yeah. October. Uh, sorry, and we're we're not behind any other previous year either. Right. But but this year there's a new common agricultural policy being implemented. There's a new basic payment scheme being implemented. There's a new greening scheme being implemented. There's a new gloss scheme. There's a new beef genomic scheme. There's a new island scheme. There's a new organic farming scheme. Was it too there's much for the farmer to take there's on? There's a new TAM scheme. No, because actually the delivery has been pretty good. I mean, currently uh, there's a total of 121,000 farmers have been paid, well over a billion euros, right, uh, in terms of basic payments and greening. Mm-hmm. And this is a 98% payment rate. Okay? okay. So comparable figures for England, let's just be clear, mm-hmm. uh, this week are 44,000 farmers, 51% payment rate, right? Um, uh, over 90% of our farmers have received over 200 million euros in terms of ANC payments. Payments will only commence in Northern Ireland for ANCs in March. They haven't even started mm-hmm. yet. Yeah. Right? So, um, uh, so, I mean, I think that... But you, the department has, has set itself as the premier department in, in Europe. Yeah. And when standards slip... Well, I'm not sure standards have slipped. Like, I mean, we, we always said that we would get payments out as quickly as we could. Uh, uh, and we've and we've done that. The vast vast majority of farmers have been paid. Uh, uh, we've held back three percent of payment mm-hmm. uh, uh, until March yeah, for yeah. good reason, just in case there's any problems or whatever. Now there is an issue in relation to young farmers, but that's because there's so many new young farmers coming in, and many of them have different arrangements. Many of them are in partnerships. Many of them have taken over part ownership of their of their family holding, uh, and therefore there's mapping and there's they are more complex applications. But but. Over half of the young farmers have actually been paid now. I think it's 53% of them have been paid. Um, we got, uh, we were contacted by, uh, actually, as it turns out, a neighbour of mine um, during the week uh, who said the person, staff member in Port Leith said it's easier to make contact with the space or sh- shuttle than get in contact with the department yeah. that you need to speak to. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I would accept that, that there have been issues in, in terms of um, making contact with someone who can give you accurate information. Uh, and we're trying to create, in fact, I spoke to the Secretary General about that today. Okay. Um, we are, uh, and actually he raised it with me uh, rather than the other way around. 
And uh, so like that is an issue. Uh, again, that is just because of the sheer volume issue of calls uh, linked to all of the schemes and the basic payment and the ANCs mm -hmm. and, you know, newly qualifying, um, you know, applicants in terms of young farmers, new entrants and so on. So, so when you have as many schemes as we've launched and, you know, if anybody can tell me what one of those schemes we shouldn't have launched last year to actually mean that we'd get a, uh, that we'd have people answering phones for the other schemes, well, then put your hand up. But I mean, we were under pressure by everybody, including the Farmers Journal yeah. uh, and all of the farming organizations, including Mocker, uh, to actually open all of the schemes that we've opened and to get as many farmers into them as we could. And many of the farming organizations would have said to me, look, the important thing is to get as many people into the schemes as possible. If the payments are delayed by a couple of months, well, then it's not ideal, but it's certainly preferable to not opening the scheme or to reducing the numbers that you accept in. So we've done what people wanted us to do which is to open as many schemes as possible and to take in as many farmers into those schemes as possible. And we are getting all of the straightforward applicants through as quickly as we can. And, you know, the vast, vast majority of them have been paid out on. We've paid out on more than half of the young farmers uh, and the other half will be done. We're, we're moving from, from one uh, uh, round of payments per week to two rounds of payments from week, uh, per week from next week on, to actually get more payments out. When do you quickly. think then that those will be, the Young Farmer National Reserve will be paid? Um, I think, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, it'll be it'll be weeks. It certainly isn't going to be months. Okay. Right? Um, hopefully within the next uh, within the next two to three weeks, we'll have an awful lot of the, um, them done, apart from the very difficult cases. Okay, so, well, uh, 2016 milk price, uh, anything you can do to alleviate it or are co-ops doing enough? Well, I mean, look, uh, I mean, I think that in some ways the milk price, tr price drop was disguised a little bit in the autumn because we had very good grass growth, very high quality milk and therefore very good bonuses on a very low base part price. Uh, we're not going to have that luxury in the autumn. No. Um, so uh, that's a concern. So, so obviously we need to do everything we can with the market tools that are available to the Commission. Does that mean raise intervention? I mean, I don't think the commission is going to do that, but I think, um, you know, we need, um, they have tried to make uh, aid to private storage much more attractive okay. for the sector. You know, Processors haven't followed suit but largely in Ireland. Some of them haven't, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I mean, look, I mean, we'll have to monitor that carefully and obviously we need to, we need to support the sector uh, as best we can. Consolidation hasn't been a huge amount of it in your tenure. Do you think it's something that's just going to be a slow burner? Yeah, and I think, you know, the industry has to move in its own time here. I think you will see more consolidation amongst uh, co-ops and amongst processors. Um, you're already seeing partnerships, by the way, that are just quietly yeah, just yeah. happening. You yeah. know? No one's making a big fuss about it. You Correct, know? If, yeah. you, if you look at the relationship between, for example, Glanby and Dairy, Dairy Gold, yeah, it's very that's strong. a very pragmatic relationship. Yeah. They use each other's infrastructure when they need to. Uh, when one is building something, the other provides cover. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think you'll see that kind of relationship happening all over the country. I'd be shocked if I'd not asked about beef forum, yeah. in particular on carcass weight limit, which could potentially, as a as a suckler farmer, put a cap uh, on weanland prices, uh, which again would impact on has a potential impact on uh, on suckler profitability. Is that something well, that I mean, is weanland prices have been the highest they've ever been? Not in the last until twelve months. Full carcass weight limits. Uh, are, uh, uh, no, but I mean, look, uh, I mean, I can't instruct the industry to uh, uh, to do anything on price, for example. Right? We've had very blunt discussions in the forum. Um, the industry essentially introduced a 12-month a um, uh, removal of any um, price restriction around mm -hmm. weight. Uh, it was a good, goodwill measure that I put a lot of pressure on them to, to facilitate last year. They made it very clear that after the 12 months, they weren't going to renew that yeah. um, farming organisations aren't that happy about that obviously I'd like if they did renew it right? yeah, yeah. Uh, because it would be less hassle for me but look you know, there's a reason why heavier animals uh, aren't wanted in factories uh, to the same extent that lighter animals are Correct. Uh, and that's because the highest paying markets want lighter animals the highest paying market at the moment is the UK mm -hmm. they want lighter animals uh, so of course there is a market for heavier animals but the highest price is being paid for the for the lighter carcasses. Now, look, you know, this is an ongoing discussion that we'll have at the forum and, you know, and I'd rather have it there. Okay. Um, but I mean, my job is to try and facilitate discussion, to put pressure on both sides, to try and find compromises and solutions. And we've successfully done that in the forum so far. But like the forum isn't and shouldn't be a lobbying exercise. Uh, what I'm focused on 
uh, between now and the end of my term is making sure that we get the strategic change that is promised from the setting up of producer organizations for the beef sector and we get the benefits of that. And I think we can negotiate all of the issues around price through producer organizations in a far more effective way than we can do it uh, in a public beef forum. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. On Tuesday, Borbia presented its report on Ireland's food exports in 2015, when another record was broken. The agency is also planning to expand its network of offices overseas. Borbia's chief executive, Aidan Cotter, answered questions from our digital editor, Thomas Hubert. Well, there has been growth, actually, in uh, virtually all of the sectors. Uh, Our beef exports last year were uh, 6% higher. Uh, Our beverage exports uh, were 10% up. Our seafood and even our dairy exports uh, both uh, grew by 4%. There is also this added value category that we call prepared consumer foods that we have defined for the first time, uh, and that has actually grown by 7%, uh, and that's very good news indeed. Now, you've mentioned exchange rates, and they have helped us, but to what extent are we dependent on the weak euro, and how dangerous could that be in the future? In an ordinary year, uh, the uh, depreciation of the euro Uh, in 2015 uh, would have been worth nearly a billion euro. Uh, But we have also seen at the same time uh, the um, uh, continued drop in global food commodity prices, 19% last year. They're now 35% off their peak in April 2011, having fallen for almost five years. So uh, it's not just exchange rates, it's about uh, a whole host of other things as well. It's about uh, the global commodity uh, uh, picture in terms of uh, prices. And uh, while exchange rates will fluctuate, and they always have, uh, there are other uh, knock-on effects as well that that, that may have. Uh, the industry has, uh, I think, uh, not um, considered that uh, exchange rates will always be this favourable, but equally they might uh, look back on uh, recent years and say they were very unfavourable in the past. Uh, there are swings and roundabouts in this, and the industry is very used to dealing with them uh, and managing them over time. Whether it's exchange rates or the Russian embargo or other uh, external factors like that, you said the industry is well prepared for them. How uh, is that illustrated? What do Irish agribusinesses do that help them be flexible and how do they deal with those issues? Well, I think the way uh, that uh, they have such a a large global footprint exporting to 175 markets, our dairy industry alone exports to 130, uh, that gives the industry a lot of options. So we have seen uh, overall not a great deal of change between uh, the uh, shares uh, of the UK, continental Europe and international markets. But, for example, uh, the uh, dollar uh, strengthening against the euro has been evident in a 40% growth and our exports, principally in dairy and beverages, the United States. Uh, and equally, uh, in the case of uh, China, uh, our exports have grown to that market by 16%. We've seen growth uh, of uh, uh, some 8% uh, to the Middle East. Uh, and uh, so the industry has uh, been uh, uh, shifting its presence in different markets, taking advantage of, uh, of the uh, changing currency situation uh, as it goes. Now, you've just announced uh, the opening of two new offices abroad in Singapore and Warsaw uh, in the coming months. I'd say that's probably a lot of taxpayers' money, so what can we get back in return? How is this going to help Irish farmers and food processors concretely? Well, I think our international presence is absolutely critical uh, to the industry. Uh, When we export to 275 markets, we have to be able to support uh, that uh, growth in markets, particularly in regions uh, where the middle classes and uh, uh, the expenditure is rising very rapidly, like in Southeast Asia, where our signal which our Singapore office will service, eight Southeast Asian markets uh, out of Singapore. Uh, We are very efficient in terms of our international presence. Uh, Many of our uh, 12 international offices at the moment are actually uh, just one-person offices uh, which uh, take um, location within the Ireland House or the embassy or uh, other state agency network. Uh, So it is a very cost-effective route that we have in our presence uh, and, uh, but we have a lot of leverage out of that presence uh, in terms of uh, the support structure we can build in those markets. You've also talked about Africa and, and establishing a presence there. Uh, Minister Simon Coveney confirmed he wanted to support that and fund that. Why Africa? Why is it important for Irish food at the moment? Uh, Africa has a population of uh, just over a billion people at the present time. Uh, in 35 years' time, that will grow to 2 billion people. Uh, our exports uh, into the African region at the moment are worth about half a billion uh, euro. Uh, it's uh, predominantly uh, dairy, 
And as our dairy industry continues to grow, uh, it is uh, the African region is going to be a key target market because there are uh, a lot of growth, not just in population, but also in terms of buying power in that marketplace. Now, finally, we've had all the positive news today, the growth, um, the expansion, but what should people be watchful for? What are the dangers uh, and the risks for Irish food exports going forward? Well, I think you've mentioned some of them uh, yourself. Uh, currency can go another way. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, sterling has, uh, has, has already come back, uh, has, uh, come back a little. It's around 75p uh, at the present time. Uh, so uh, there is uh, going to be a swings and roundabouts, as I say there. Um, uh, after falling for uh, five years now, global food commodity prices uh, uh, may, be, may be set to turn, but we can't, nobody would, would uh, be prepared to call that. Uh, but certainly... Um, uh, you would expect that there is a limit to how far they can they can they can fall, given the uh, growth in the global population of 80 million people every every year, an estimated growth in the middle classes of double that of 150 million people, which will continue to support the growth in the global demand for food. Okay. Aidan Cutter, chief executive of Borbia, thank you very much. Thank you. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at FarmersJournal.ie. One market which has proved most difficult to crack is the U.S. beef sector. My colleague Odile Evans met the American meat analyst Kevin Greer and asked him what Irish exporters need to do to grow their presence stateside. Well, I tried to convey uh, three three main points. Number one, uh, it's a market that has been starved for for beef because the supplies of beef and the supplies of cattle have been declining for about 15 years. And that appeared to reach a tipping point in 2014, 2015, in the sense that uh, supplies became very, very low, and uh, everybody from packers through to cattle feeders and retailers uh, were scrambling throughout the entire two years looking for supplies. Supplies are finally starting to increase, but it's slow, and so this is a market that's going to be short supplies for, for at least a few years to come, relatively speaking. So even though it's starting to increase, uh, it's still relatively short. The other point I wanted to make was that uh, this is a market that has uh, seen strong demand for beef. We're, we're really glad to see that. Uh, prices are high, but yet consumers in North America, Canada, and the United States have stepped up to the meat case and, and are buying beef in a big way. We're, we're eating less because there is less around, but we're paying a lot more for it. So demand has been very, very good, and that's another point I wanted to convey. And the third point is, you know, so... It's a market that wants beef, it's a market that's in, the beef is in strong demand, but it's also a market that is supplied by very, very efficient uh, cattle feeders, very, very efficient uh, meat packers that, that get the job done and get the beef out to consumers in a very, very cost-effective way. So uh, on the one side, it's a market that wants beef from all around the world, but the second is that it's very, very competitive, very, very strong companies. And you also said, though, that American consumers have developed a taste for grain-fed beef. Beef Is there a market for our Irish grass-fed beef there? Well, there's a, you know, how do I answer that? I mean, there is a market for grass-fed in the sense that uh, grass-fed is a regular part of, our, of the ground beef diet in, uh, in North America from all around the world, Australia, New Zealand, uh, all around, is in our, our ground beef. Now, is there a market for grass-fed, say, steaks and roasts and that sort of thing? That's a different story. Um, we would need to be educated about that because we're, our palates have been uh, used to grain-fed over the last 60 years or so. Um, it's a taste that we've grown to like, and rightly so. So, um, so to, if, for grass-fed, in terms of, again, a steak or a roast, that would be something new to us. It uh, doesn't mean that it, we're not ready for it, but it's just, it's, it would be totally new. Yeah. You say you don't call feedlots factory farms as we would. How, how do you view them? Feedlots are the place where cattle go to get finished on a high-energy diet. Um, it was not me that used the word factory. I've heard other people use that. Uh, it's, it's certainly not a term that... Uh, Anybody in North America uses in the sense that uh, it's, a, as I say, it's the final part of the of the cattle production process. It's the part again. The, if the cattle will be uh, living for two years, maybe two and a half years, um, most of that time it is on either its mother's milk or it's on pasture or hay. And then for the final 
four to six months, it might be on a high grain diet in a feedlot. These feedlots are very large. They bring cattle in from all around the United States into feedlots that might be uh, 10,000 or more head. Uh, and so um, that's, that's just one page, final phase of the production of, of, of cattle. And, but you said ultimately up until 2020 you still see a market for Irish beef in the U.S.? I said up until 2020 we're gonna, we probably won't see kill levels up to what they were in 2013. That's, yeah. that's what I said specifically. Yeah. Uh, in other words, I'm trying to convey the, the attendees here that um, this is a market that's going to stay short for a long time. So we're going we're to increase our kills in 2016, 2017, so on. Mm -hmm. But even at the end of this decade, we still will probably only equal up to the kills in 2013. So, okay. it, you know, I, I equate the cattle industry to like a big ocean liner. It takes a long time for that ocean liner to return. It's not like poultry that can, it's not like hogs that can, it's, it takes a long time. Okay. Thank you for talking to you. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Another area where predictions are hard to make is the grain market. Our Northern Ireland correspondent, Peter McCann, met Paul Temple, the main man in charge of crops at the UK Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board, to get his views on the evolution of grain prices. I think every farmer is aware of, unfortunately, the world grain price, which is really in the doldrums. Uh, we've had this unique period where we've had three years of harvests that have actually built up stocks. Um, we haven't had a sequence like that for a good 20 years. Now, there is a growing demand out there every year for another 70 million tonnes across the world, but at the moment, we're managing to more than meet it. And the market, which is very much driven by sentiment, is comfortable with both the stocks and the current prospects. Well, you, you were talking about uh, some of the work that, that, that the AHDB is doing Particularly, the monitor farms seem to be just standard commercial farms. Um, what are some of the main points that has come from that so far and the work that you've done? Yes, you're right. The monitor farms are just commercial farms. Uh, they went through a process of, of asking to be won and becoming selected. And what we do is, in across regions, we put them under real scrutiny. There's a local group of farmers that meet and they discuss what the farm is doing, the costs their cultivations and what they're going to do in the future. So it gives us a practical flavour of problem solving in a variety of circumstances. And so we can sort of see one cultivation technique that a farmer's doing which might be strip till, a conventional ploughing and power harrowing, and then on another farm you can have no till with cover crops. And what it does is give us a great handle on practical learning from the sidelines. And now, as far as the, there's been a lot of talk here today about a variation of fixed costs across farms and a spread them across acres. From the monitor farms, have you seen is there any interesting results in that? Yeah, we, we are seeing that. I mean, as was pointed out at this meeting time and time again, we call things variable costs, but actually across the farming circumstances, they aren't variable. You can't compromise your yield through fungicides and herbicides. So it is the fixed costs that actually are variable between farms often for a variety of circumstances, and just ch chasing larger and larger farming areas is sometimes not the solution. Paul Temple, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. More and more, the sustainability of our food is a condition of success on many of those export markets. Carbon emissions in particular will become increasingly important, and livestock farming has a bad reputation in this area. But Dr John Highland of Chagask told Odile Evans that shifting away from meat and dairy is not a solution for environmentally conscious consumers. My research looks into the typically or typical dietary intakes of the Irish population. Uh, it deals with food consumption, how much they consume on a typical day, and it applies a carbon footprint to that. And what are the, the main findings from this? We have found that uh, the typical uh, carbon footprint associated with food consumption of the public Ireland is pretty much in line with uh, carbon footprint seen in the UK and across Europe. We found that uh, foods of animal origin contribute the most towards the footprint, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not mm -hmm. as black and white as that. Other foods uh, with high sugar content uh, contribute the lowest, but uh, you would not advocate uh, having a diet based around sugar and high sugar snacks. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, foods of animal origin have many micronutrients such as iron and zinc, which uh, contribute towards a healthy diet. So it's uh, not a case of giving up on our products. And of course, a lot of emissions as well happen 
at the farm stage. Mm. There's huge potential within the sector to lower the footprint, which would uh, obviously contribute to lower uh, emissions associated with food consumption. Okay. And in your presentation, you were comparing, you know, um, feedlots, shall we say, and grass-based production. Yeah. What did you find there? Uh, well, that wasn't part of the yeah. study. It was one of the comments that was made after it. Uh, a lot of the NGOs, uh, non-government organizations across the world, which in- environmental NGOs uh, would advocate uh, that if you're going to eat meat, uh, red meat, which has a high carbon footprint to eat on grass-based systems, a lot of feedlot systems, uh, animal welfare wouldn't be as good. Uh, a lot of the feed uh, could be coming from Brazil, uh, soya-based, which would contribute to deforestation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have that in feedlots, whereas a lot of the uh, beef that would be produced in Ireland or lamb uh, would be on extensive systems, uh, which you cannot grow anything else. Mm. So you're not taking food or you're not taking land that could be grown, that could be used to grow mm. food for uh, human consumption away from that. You're using land that most of the time cannot be used for anything else. Okay. But, yeah. Uh, the intensive could lower the carbon footprint, but there's other considerations to make as well. And what about swapping uh, red meat in the diet for, say, vegetables or, you know? Uh, there has been one study that has found that uh, you, you can do that, but you have to also, you know, make up the nutrition content that you're missing out on and the calories. And there's also a potential that you could swap pollutions, essentially. You could lower your carbon footprint, but you could increase your water footprint. Uh, there has been a study that's been recently published that uh, has said like if you reduce your meat content and replace it with vegetables, you, you only see a slight reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, all things being equal in terms of nutrients and uh, calories provided, but your water footprint goes through the roof. So again, it's the emissions factor is so high for red meat that you could reduce your red meat intake, mm. but in actual fact, and do very little to reduce your uh, to reduce your emissions mm-hmm. because it's got a so, such a high uh, emissions factor. Uh, so a lot, if on the farm scale, it, there is huge potential for this to be reduced mm. by a large amount, and this will go a long way to reducing the emissions associated with the overall food yeah. consumed. Uh, Perfect. Thank you very much. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Now let's hear from our farmer writer, Kieran Lennon, who brings young bulls to beef on his family farm. Digital editor Thomas Hubert asked him about breeding, calving, and always trying to keep ahead of the game. Right, so we're a suckler calf to beef farm near Ratoth in County Meath. We're 100% AI and we use continental sires, although we've dabbled in a bit of Solaire this year. Our bulls are brought through to beef at uh, 15 months of age, so we're hitting that premium under 16-month bull market. And our heifers are finished at 20 months of age, so 2014's heifers are nearing their date with destiny around now. That system allows us to keep cow numbers up, so there's no animal staying on the farm for more than uh, one winter, so no, no beef animal. And we've tried to opt for a fertile cow. We've been using AI for 10 years and keeping our, all of our own replacements. So at this stage, I would say 90% of the cows on the farm were bred on the farm. We took a few kind of, uh, I suppose, source cows about 11 years ago from a, a local dairyman, a cousin of ours, their blonde type Frisian cross. Uh, all of our good cows, you can trace back to those. So we use bulls like, we use top quality Smental bulls, we use Charlie, Limousine. Uh, we use Belgian Blue where needs be at the end to tighten calving up. But um, I suppose, yeah, we have a big, big uh, policy of, of breed well. So a ton of feed is an ounce of breeding, um, which really works for us because we're trying to hit that 16-month bull market. We're limited with age, so we need to get as much kilos on the animal before he hits that age target, and we do. So we try and make really, really good silage as well, and it, it forms the basis of, of all of our feeds. We wean indoors over, a, I suppose, a six-day period. I, I covered it in one of my columns there recently. Um, it takes the hassle out of it, grass, and we just have to keep an eye and treat them well for the weaning period. Going well so far, we have about uh, 15 calves left to wean. This year has been... Um very very good on the grass side um, maybe uh, a bit tricky on the, the t- weather and temperature side uh, in the autumn at the, the weaning period how did that go for you in terms of health uh, and all that I think feeding must not have been a problem but what about disease yeah well we went from a situation where we were looking at keeping a lot of the stock out into December to having to house kind of emergency in an emergency scenario we had to house a lot of our stock in the space of two weeks um, we had our first case of grass tetany there in about 10 years, with probably one of the best cows in the place. We found her down. We got to her quick enough, but 
I suppose it's a function of the weather. She was stressed. There was a big Charlie calf pulling out of her. Thankfully, she's fine now. Like losing a cow in a 50 cow herd is massive, especially the fact that she was bred on farm. We're a closed herd, so we don't go buying. So even though we're trying to expand, we're, so we're still maintaining this philosophy, keeping good genetics coming through because, in our opinion, that's what makes us work. It's, it's completely breeding, nothing else. No special feeds. Um, a bit of grassland management, not a lot. We could probably do a lot more, but it's a really, really breed and focused agenda we have at home. How is that working for you this year? What is the plan for the spring in terms of work on the next crop? Uh, yeah. Any change compared to last year? No, I suppose we're still going to hit the 16-month bull. We're going to keep, we're, do that repeatedly. So that means we need to keep going for that kind of a fast-growing animal. I suppose if we went for a, an early maturing a type Angus or Herford, we could probably get them out quicker. But I suppose the kilos wouldn't be there. We're not going to start relying on Angus schemes and such. A big problem, well not a big problem, but the main problem with that is that you can't be draft animals off every day when you're trying to hit an age market. So you need to have your calving tight. We're down to about 10 weeks, which is good, but it could be a lot better. So we'll dabble in some synchronising this year, hopefully. We'll, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do it yet. We'll talk to some beef researchers in grains or that and just see what we can do to really tighten it up. And I suppose it's going to help with heat detection as well. As soon as we finish calving, uh, there's no rest. We're literally straight into heat detection for AI, which takes a lot of labour. We're lucky in that sense. There's three of us, so there's myself, my father, my brother. We all have interests off farm, be it at college or employment. But we're all very conscious that we make our money around breeding time. Our tight cabin spread allows us to hit that age market. It allows us to get our heifers away before their second winter. And it's, it's vital to us. So as a farm, yeah, it's, it's quite labour intensive at times. But look, we like what we do and financially the rewards are there. But I suppose synchronising with our cattle it would be the first step in terms of uh, taking a bit of that labour away and also tightening up our spread. Now, having said that, the 60-month bull market could go overnight. It's quite a volatile market. You know, uh, you take the price at 15 months and 29 days of age, that's it. You have no rigor room. The amount of meal you've pumped into those animals, if you leave them go on, you'll find that your returns diminish fairly quick. So you're relying on a premium, um, which is there at the moment in certain factories. Whether it will be there in the future remains to be seen. Just on that side of thing, the market, um, who do you sell to and uh, how do you see uh, your relationship with factories? Uh, is, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Um, what about grading and all that? How do you see this side of the industry going forward? Yeah, well, I suppose uh, a couple of months ago, Michael Drennan would have raised issues with the grading system in terms of reward and farmer for confirmation. So if you have more muscly carcass, you're going to produce more meat. And his issue was that the pricing... So the six cents bonus for every confirmation grade was calculated at a time when beef was was much much cheaper. Um, it needs to change. It, it has to work on a percentage basis as opposed to a fixed, uh, an absolute monetary value. In terms of our relationship with the factories, I would say it's good. Our sixty month bulls go to Keypack in Clonee principally because they take a sixty month bull and give a premium. If you were to go 25 kilometers down the road to Euro Farm Foods, a bull is a bull to them, so it's not worth our while to go there with an, with an underage animal. Our heifers go to usually to the leak in Euro Farm, but look, as I said, it's all about price. Whoever's whoever's offering best gets them. That's just the way it goes. Relationships with factories, look, they're good when they're paying us well. You know, it, it's the same. Having said that, I'd like to see more not transparency, but more communication as to what factories are making where things go I suppose it'll take it's a, it's a grey area and we can bang on tables all we want as farmers but I suppose if we're shown returns if we're shown margins if we're shown what's made on a, on a carcass where what or what goes where and to whom and for how much there'll be a bit less and maybe the fact that we're not being shown that is a fact in itself Kieran, thank you very much and uh, good luck for spring calving coming soon and uh, you can read everything from Kieran at farmersjournal.ie in our farmer rights section the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Last weekend also saw the end of the BT Young Scientist Exhibition, where students researching enzymes in animal feed won the top prize. My colleague Amy Fitzgibbon met Diana and Maria Louise from Balbriggan in County Dublin. I'm here with Maria Fufusan and Diana Bora from Loretto College, Balbriggan, who have won the 52nd BT Young Scientist and Technology Exhibition for 2016. So congratulations on your win. You must be delighted. Thank you so much. We are. It was, it was a massive shock to us because we, when we initially came here, we just wanted to spread our ideas, our findings with the public. And 
it was just fascinating that we actually won the whole competition. And Maria, how did you feel when you heard you won? It was unbelievable. The, our names, we haven't been called down for the whole of the ceremony. So uh, we, at, the end, at the end, at the end, it was like it was this award or it was nothing. And it was kind of embarrassing if we didn't get anything because all of our school did so so well. Yes. And um, one of your students got the runner-up award. Yeah, and you to Holly, yes. yeah. yeah, she put so much work into it. And can you tell me how old you are? Uh, I'm 15. Okay, and Maria? I'm 16. Mm -hmm. You're 16. And so, can one of you maybe can tell me a little bit about the project? Um, well, we came up with the project when our grandparents have both have farms and they grow animals for domestic use, but they we've, we've noticed a significant difference between the animals they raise and the ones that are industrially raised. So, we looked at the what was used to enhance their growth, uh, the ones that we find in store, um, and we found about these enzymes that are used nowadays because in the past they've been using antibiotics and hormones. And what particular enzyme were you looking at in this experiment? Uh, well, a mixture of enzymes is used um, in animal feed and especially poultry feed, but the ones we focused on were phytic, silanase, and beta glucanase, which were the three most commonly added enzymes in most animal feeds. These were the ones I used at the moment, but until now they have really been questioned and all of the information we find online about them, it's all positive feedback and we kind of want to question this, yeah, we, we're yeah. Uh, something fishy. <laughs> and, your, and your project looks really at the effect of these enzymes in animal feed on earthworms. And what were your main findings? Well, we found out that not only did some of the worms not respond towards noxious substances, towards dangerous substances, but they also couldn't respond towards attractants, which is a very big deal, see, because they need to respond towards attractants to be able to find a source of food. And they would also need to be able to respond towards danger so that they wouldn't end up dying because they couldn't sense anything. Their roaming was also affected. Their ability to search for food was shortened by an extremely large number. And when you say attractants, what, what does that mean? It was the uh, yeah, the substance that we use as an attractant on our on our test plates were uh, was methyl butanol, and this is a waste product of the coli that they consume. So uh, the fact that they couldn't sense this, um, that means that in the environment they wouldn't be able to, to find the, their food source. Okay, and did you conduct your experiments in a laboratory? Uh, no, we actually, well we did, yes. Uh, we set up our own lab at, in our school at the back of the lab. It was actually really funny because we actually got the nickname of Worm Girls. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were the Worm Girls at the back of Miss McNally's lab, uh, surrounded by stacks of agar plates with our microscope. We were like, leave me alone, I'm, I'm working on my worms now. Well, now you have the last lab. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. So, yeah, so you conducted your experiments in the lab. And was there anything else particular you, you found? Their lifespan was also shortened dramatically. In our highest country... By how much, uh, would you say? Um, well, in the end, when we compared our results, the controls, only two of the worms died uh, over the uh, for three weeks. But then in our highest concentration, the 0 0.25 grams, all of the worms were dead. We were surprised by this because we didn't expect all of the worms to be dead. We did expect the majority of them to be dead, but no. And so would you say this particular enzyme you were looking at, or the enzymes you were looking at, are they quite common in animal feed used in Ireland? Uh, definitely. They're used all over Europe. They, they're they the aid, that, the modern aid that is are used in this, uh, this animal feed to enhance the growth of industrially uh, produced animals. Okay, and finally, kind of, what, what are the main implications for farming in this, for farmers? Well, our results are actually of interest to farmers because the soil fertility around the farms where they use these substances is, is that soil fertility is at risk because these yeah. nematodes die off and they can't car carry out their function anymore in the ecosystem. Therefore, they can't break down dead matter and they can't... Um, so when farmers spread slurry, they're, they're effectively doing damage to the earthworms? Um, that was actually our next project that we were going to do. We, one of the judges recommended that we see if there are still enzymes present in the feces of the chickens and other animals and then we would be able to conclude that if the feces which we know is spread onto farms onto farm uh, lands as fertilizers yeah. we would be able to see that although they're used as fertilizers they would end up killing the actual fertilizers okay wow and will you be expanding on this before you go to brussels Definitely, yes. we'll definitely expand on this because now that we see that it's gotten so much attention, and uh, we definitely want to want to even look at the 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 effect it has on the actual animal, on the chicken, but also expanding into the human healthcare aspect of it. Looking if uh, if there's enzymes present in the muscle tissue of chickens, and seeing seeing what happens when humans are taking this. Okay, well, thank you very much for talking to me, girls. Congratulations on your win. Thank you. Thank you.
You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Finally, let's hear from Irish Country Living Consumer Editor, Kira Leahy, who has advice to help you get your personal finances in order for the new year. She spoke with Anthony Jordan. It's a new year. People are like, right, let's get the finances in order. And the first thing you need to do is look at how you react to money. So you've got an extra few euros in your pocket. Does it burn a hole or are you eager to bury it away for a rainy day? And I interviewed Susan Hayes, who has written a few books, including the Savvy Woman's Guide to Financial Freedom. And she says it's really important. She's got a fun quiz to help you figure out where you stand and what changes you need to make. Because the thing is, Anthony, it's not a case of one shoe fits all. You know, you could be great with money. I could be really bad. And, you know, the solution that works for you isn't necessarily the solution that works for me. The thing is, if you can't handle money, you know, you're never going to have any more. But you can change your ways. People think it involves lots of pain and sacrifice, but it doesn't have to be like that. It's about enjoying your money and managing it better rather than wondering where it's all gone. Exactly. And come here, what's the first step? Because we all know getting started is the hardest part of it all. Yeah, so... I suppose the first step is actually probably the most enjoyable step. It's deciding what you want to do with your money, you know, and you need to have a plan and a specific plan at that. So you need to think smart. So S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and timely financial goals. These are all important. But I suppose specificity is really important. You know, saying you want to be better with money is like saying you want to lose weight. There's no specific goal there. It's very abstract. So sit down and say, right, what do I want? Want to achieve my money this year and it could be something like a holiday you know um, so think about where you're going to go how much is it going to cost um, if your dream holiday is a five star hotel in the Canaries that might not necessarily be achievable but what is achievable is it a four star hotel in the Canaries is it a five star hotel in Ireland you know don't throw your dream out the window just because it's not achievable and frivol away your money. Look at what is achievable and plan towards that and then break it down. If that holiday, you know, if a four star in the Canary is going to cost 2,500 and you want to go in May, break it down. That's 500 euros a month. Where are you going to get that money? Are you going to save it or are you going to earn more money? And research is very important in that as well, obviously. Mm-hmm. Now, the next tip I'm interested in, because it says here that you uh, to learn to love budget. Now, how is that possible? Yeah, I was a bit sceptical about that as well. Because I'm just looking at that now and I'm thinking, oh God. Yeah, but actually when I said it to Susan, I was like, I, I was exactly the same. And she said, okay, right, let's take the example that you have a weekend ahead of you. Your weekend is free, okay? So you decide, right, I'm going to have a bit of time with my friends. Maybe I'm going to go out for lunch. I'm going to get the, you know, get stuff organized for the week so that my week isn't manic, you know. You basically budget your time to get the most out of your weekend. And she says it's the exact same with money. You go away and you budget your money so that you enjoy planning on what you're going to do with it. And more importantly, you enjoy doing it because you're not putting your laser card in the machine thinking, oh my God, am I going to be in the red? And the other thing as well, as she said, when you've put that bit of work into budgeting, you're less tempted to blow, you know, 100 euros in- impulsively because you know the effect it's going to have on the rest of your month. And I suppose when she put it like that, I, I myself was like, yeah, it sounds a lot more achievable. I suppose after Christmas too, because Christmas is such an intense time of the year, you're spending, you're spending, you're spending. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's almost difficult in the new year to kind of really cut back on things. And um, I mean, you really do have to come back on things, do you? Look, there is a whole chapter in the book about curb your spending. And I suppose when people see curb your spending, the first thing they think is, oh, it means I'm not going to be able to go out for that dinner. I'm not going to be able to afford, you know, to go to my concert I really want to go to this summer. You know, she makes it very clear. It's not about that. It's basically managing your money better and curbing your spending in other areas so you don't have to forego on the things that you really, really want to do. And she said there's three areas to really look at. First is to review your direct debits. So stuff like TV and phone packages. Are you really getting the best out of them? Your gym membership. Literally, did you go three times last year? Is it worth it? Or if you do use any of these, can you get a better deal? The next thing is to look at your financial services, such as life insurance, car insurance, home bills. Look, we've said it again and again and again on the consumer pages in Country Living. You really can make savings that way. And people are allergic to sitting down and actually doing it. But there's fantastic cost comparison websites out there, such as bonkers.e. And it means that that little bit of extra work means you could have savings to go away for, you know, a night away. 
people kind of think they're alone, don't they? I mean, saving money, it's, it almost seems like a massive challenge for families and everything else, especially, especially as I said, after Christmas. Mm-hmm. So expert advice, I mean, is, it does go a long way in helping people save money. It does go a long way. And the thing is, when you say expert advice, Anthony, people just think, right, this is going to cost money. There are loads of free resources out there that will really, really help. For example, the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, um, they have Consumer Help Dolly, which is a fantastic website. You know, we just talked about there about making savings on bills and stuff. They compare all credit cards, savings accounts, current accounts. They do all the hard work for you, you know. So that's a great resource to use. And you're saving time as well. Yeah, there, absolutely. Um, the Pensions Board as well is a free resource that will help you look at your pension. And they literally will help you do anything from reading your statement to looking at your contributory pension. And then as well, I mean, so many of us have overpaid revenue and we can reclaim um, a lot of that money back in regards to medical expenses, personal tax credits and tuition fees. Again, it's a free resource. You know, some people do pay for experts in regards to reviewing their life insurance policies or stocks, for example. And, you know, in regards to that, just make sure to do a quick cost benefit analysis. Is the money you save with them every year more than the cost of the appointment? If so, it's money well spent. If not, what's the point in wasting your time and money? Exactly. And finally, Kira, I'm looking at other ways, not just save money, but other ways to make money as well, isn't there? Absolutely. And look at farmers are in quite a unique position in regards to that there is a lot more flexibility in this regard. So I suppose the last thing is, you know, to be really objective here and look at the products you are producing on the farm and how you can make them more profitable. You know, packaging products can have really good potential. Also look at opportunity for outhouses, fields, even areas of the house that aren't being used. Being creative and open minded could really work out well financially and have a bit more money coming in rather than money going out and exactly and even even just add on that even efficiency on the farm too Absolutely. i mean obviously there's other ways of making money but even saving money in terms of the farm yard is investigating into your grass management doing all that kind of stuff too Absolutely. it definitely saves money and it's definitely worth a look in the uh in the new year absolutely and And that's always uh, emphasised in the Farmers Journal and this full article is in Irish Country Living this week perfect Kira. thank you very very much for talking to us the Irish Farmers Journal podcast online at farmersjournal.ie on the Irish Farmers Journal app and on iTunes every Thursday brought to you by Ornua the home of Irish dairy